welcome to LOA Today. I'm Walt Thiessen. With me today is the woman who knows how to set personal boundaries, Alex Standy. This is your daily dose of happy. We are so happy you decided to join us today. And Alex, I got to tell you, I mean, you know as well as I do, I run Louise's gardening business. We're in the midst mm -hmm. of the high point of the season. And if there is a better day to be doing a podcast, it's I don't know of a better day than this one. I needed this today more than anything else. Because why been, this it's crazy right now. I mean, it's it's bananas. well, there's a couple of things going on. First of all, Louise and I are planning to go away next week. So we have to get everything set up, right? Nice. Uh, nice. Crew has to have and and we just went on a hiring spree. So like we have right. a huge new crew of people in addition to our our veterans. Mm -hmm. And it's the busiest time of year. And you put all that together, it's crazy. Yeah. So you need to have a little mental health. Facts. And that's what the show does. So welcome that's to true. the Mental Health Hour, right? <laughs> <laughs> and of course, we have a special guest joining us today. Her name is Nancy Picard. And Nancy, she's quite a, a credentialed person. She's a certified integrative coach through the Ford Institute. This is like high-level credentials going on. <laughs> this is no, this is this is impressive stuff. She's certified as a breakthrough shadow coach, an empowered parent coach a courage coach, a healing your heart coach, a leadership coach, a holistic, I mean, the, the list, this is a long <laughs> list. I, 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 well, I'm going to start with this, Nancy. Do you ever stop getting credentials? <laughs> no, I know I don't. I actually just am starting the certification next week with David Kessler on grief. So wow. um, no, I, I, you know, I have a growth mindset. So I'm always like, what's the next thing that I could bring to my clients that I haven't, I don't have as many tools as I could use. So healing your heart, which is one of my certifications is amazing when it comes to divorce or estrangement, but I actually find that it's not as strong when somebody's actually lost a partner to death. It's very different. Mm -hmm. And so I just recently had two clients and I rewrote like a, a couple of coaches and I re rewrote healing your heart for loss instead of just for death, actually. Oh, okay. um, and it was definitely better, but I still felt like, oh, I could use more. And so this this is brand new. He's just doing this. And I jumped on it. Starts I love the next, attitude. Starts next week. Yeah. Cool. No, I love the attitude. Well, first of all, because I honestly believe that the best of us are the ones who are constantly learning. Mm -hmm. constantly trying to improve, constantly trying to be better versions of who we are. And Bigger, better, just, braver. <laughs> which is your motto. That's right. Yeah, exactly. I like that it, motto. It's a good Thank motto, you. isn't it? Yeah. yeah it's really good. How, how, where'd you come up with that one anyway? Oh, God, it's so funny. Well, I climbed Kilimanjaro at 61, and I thought I was going to write a book. What's your Kilimanjaro? You know, so what is looking... What is your next big thing that you want to do? You don't have to climb Kilimanjaro, but you might want to get into a relationship or leave a job or lose 50 pounds, whatever it is, right? Mm -hmm. um, but what's your Kilimanjaro was not going to get people to read my book. And so <laughs> for, for months, I kept throwing out to my publisher and my boyfriend, who's also a writer, and to my a friend of mine, who's a book agent, I guess threw out everything I could think of and they, nobody liked everything. And then one night I sat up in the middle of the night and said, bigger, better, braver. And wow. everyone loved it. And that was a download from the universe. So I say, thank you universe. And that's the name of my book. That's really great. First of all, when we get those downloads, when we get those messages like that, mm -hmm. and second of all, when we can actually read them, detect them, yes. pick up on them, which yes. you did. So pat yourself on the back. Well done. Yeah, no, it was a definite download from the universe. And I, because everyone loved it. So it was like, of course they loved it. It wasn't my idea. You know, <laughs> it, it came from the universe. We all love it. <laughs> That's fabulous. And how'd you get into uh, coaching? I mean, I know there's always an interesting story there. That's why I asked that mm. question, because I've interviewed a lot of coaches. And there's always, there, there, it, it's usually some story that has some kind of crisis that was a personal crisis that led into, I want to help people in the same way. Yeah. I'm guessing yeah. it's the same thing with you. Yeah. You know what? We, we coach from our, from our, like not our wounds, but from our scars. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we see what it's done for us and then we want to help other people. And so 
Um, for me, I, I really, the catalyst was I got divorced after 26 years. It was not my idea. It was not something I wanted. And it really broke me. And mm -hmm. it took me a really long time to recover, to stop being the victim in my story, to stop judging my life by his life. Um, it took me even longer to recognize that I was being other referenced you know, I saw myself through the eyes of how he saw me. So when he no longer wanted me, then I, I saw myself as not worthy anymore. And mm -hmm. it took me a really long time to remember who I was and to love myself and trust myself and to become self-referred. You know, I know how good I am. I know what I bring to the table and I don't need anybody else to tell me that. So... The biggest lesson for me was that I went through my whole probably first 50 years of my life thinking that I was half of a whole. And the reason I was so strong was because I had the other half. Mm -hmm. And now I know I'm, I'm whole all by myself. I'm yes. worthy just because I'm breathing. And that was a huge lesson for me. And I want other people to learn that. It's a really important point, too, because I think a lot of people look to relationships, primary relationships, um, to fill them out, so to speak, to mm -hmm. you know, fill in the holes. Right. And I don't think most people who are in that space realize that is the basis for an unstable relationship. Right. It's Actually. a relationship that really can't survive. So, hey, so many people go, yeah. word? Even recently, just like I'm, I'm home, I, I, my dog got really badly bitten um, two weeks ago from a pit mm -hmm. bull and I'm still sort of recovering from it. And mm -hmm. so I can tell that I'm like not that happy in the moment. And I realized that, well, I can't, that has to come from me. Like I can't say, think about like, well, why is it my partner like working harder to make me happy or this or that? Mm -hmm. It's an inside job. I can't put mm -hmm. it on anybody else. So I have to sit in it and figure out like, what is it? What are these emotions trying to show me? And then do my own work, you know? I mean, even though we're coaches, we're in it all the time. That's right, yeah. Uh, my, my wife has a background, a uh, former psychotherapist. Mm -hmm. And when you're a therapist, uh, you're, you're coaches, so to speak, they call them supervisors. Um, other therapists who you quote, report to, unquote, meaning right. that they're there to help you work through your stuff so that you can be right. there for your clients. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and she just kept talking about that over and over again, particularly early on in our relationship, how vitally important it is to have that kind of support when you're providing support to somebody else. Right. Yeah. I and mean, we do it. I, I, first of all, I'm always getting another certification. So I'm <laughs> always in the conversation. Yeah. Like, you know, I'm always working on myself. I just hung up from a class in, um, from the same, my organization that I have a lot of my certifications. We're starting one called Jump. Uh, Jump and your life will appear. So I'm actually going to be Ooh. doing two at the same time, Ooh. but that's one that I mentor in. But so you're always in the conversation. And like when I started this class, I was thinking, I don't even know what I'm jumping to. Like I haven't even, I started the class because I'm in the certification. I need to, but I haven't even thought about what's my next jump. And so um, I have to think about it. Yeah. Well, that's important. It's important yeah. to get that part out. Yeah. yeah. You, also, you also made a really interesting reference. You, uh, well, that was part of the phrase, actually. You, you talked about being other referenced. What did that mean? It means that I saw myself through the eyes of my ex-husband. And so for 26 or 28 years, you know, he thought that I was amazing. And so I thought I was amazing. And then mm. when he no longer wanted me anymore, it actually didn't matter what other people said to me. Like if I would be dating and the guy would say, oh my God, you're so smart and you're so beautiful and you're such a good athlete and all of this, I would be thinking in my head, what do you know? Like, oh dear. <laughs> you know, like, what do you know? Then you obviously aren't any smarter because, you know, my husband who I trusted and believed knew me so well, he no longer wanted me. And mm -hmm. so, you know, so it's that kind of stuff. You, you need mm -hmm. to, you need to be able to love and trust yourself and stay in alignment with everything you tell yourself you're going to do so that you can love and trust yourself. And then you won't need somebody else's opinion. Yeah, boy, that really is true. 
In That's fact, so uh, as, as you're talking there, it occurs to me that the the, the other person that, that you're referencing and that, 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 that other reference that you're talking about, uh -huh. that reference is basically a way of saying, I don't refer to myself. I depend on somebody else for my sense of identity. Yes, exactly. And I've got news for you. There's a zillion of us out there that are other referenced, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. They judge how happy they are from the people in their lives. If they're happy, you can be happy. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you're taking your temperature by taking other people's temperature. Yeah. It's very easy to do. Very easy. I, I, I like to refer to Alex. In fact, you heard in the intro, I refer to her as the woman who really knows how to set personal boundaries. I know. And, I saw that. Right? Yeah. <laughs> And, yeah, and, the, and, yeah. And and, and Alex, when I when I recorded that, what I was thinking about is stories you've told about you know your own experiences in life and so forth, where you are really mm -hmm. good at setting boundaries. Uh, and in that context, I think about how you could easily that you had many opportunities in your life where you could easily have been doing exactly what we've been talking about here. You could have become other reference. You could have been making your sense of identity dependent upon somebody else. But you learned kind of the hard way that that's really not the way to go. Right? No, it's not the way to go. You got to be yeah. a whole person by yourself before you can mm -hmm. be help to anybody else. Yeah. yeah, especially that before you can be mm -hmm. of help to anybody else. Right. Yeah, you got to have something to give before you can give it. Exactly. Right. Can't right. can't give from an empty wallet, you know. And you have to put your own oxygen mask on first. Before yes. You can, yes, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's one of my certifications as a boundary coach. So that's a great conversation for <laughs> there you. Go. Yeah. I love boundaries. I love a good boundary this time. I <laughs> love a good boundary conversation. <laughs> so how many boundaries have you set this week? No, I mean we can go. I am a boundary <laughs> badass. Yeah. I actually had boundary tests this week. Get boundary a boundary test? test? A boundary test, yeah. I had I had previously, Walt knows this, I had previously set some boundaries to to have no contact with my father. Mm -hmm. And I'm getting pressure from his side of the family his ex-wife my stepmother who i'm still like cool with and she's like, you only have one father blah 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 excuses excuses and i'm like yeah but that's not my problem though he made this this way I, that's right. not my issue that right. if he can't communicate that's his problem if he right. can't handle having kids in his life again that's his problem that's not a me problem just because he's my father right he hasn't Good. proved it Good. But I okay. did stop and think about it for a day. She was like, oh, that's your only father and blah, blah, blah. You could be dying soon and you never know. And just all the family pressure. And I'm just right. like, I thought about it. I was like, yeah, I'm going through a lot of medical stuff. Maybe he should know and da, 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 da. And I was like, no, nah, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. I fell for it for about five seconds. And then I was like, no. Nah. <laughs> you don't take I was like, who, who, who was that? That was not Alex. That was not Alex answering that phone call. <laughs> Mm, okay yeah families put pressure mm -hmm. yep they put pressure and in the process of putting pressure they basically this this is one example of how other people provide mirrors to us mm -hmm. they mirror back to us that which we most need to pay attention to right. yes and, and what we're putting out there and when you put that combination together you end up with situations like this where you're challenged and challenges happen mm -hmm. yeah but but there's an interesting piece out of I mean, I, you didn't actually say it because you're actually a very kind person, Alex, but you, you could have said, well, the ball's Am in I? his court. <laughs> I mean, it's not like he didn't have the opportunity for all these years to reach out and do something. Why has See, he done anything? If it's really that important. He does it in a sneaky way. Like he's had my phone number. My phone number hasn't changed in 20 years. So he's had my number. But for him to go around to other people that know me and complain that he has no relationship with me, to get right. them to tell me, you know what I mean? Like just mm -hmm. that part about it was already, yeah. I'm all set. You can't even confront me on your own. So how, how are we going to have a conversation? We're not even confront. How about just call you up? That, exactly. <laughs> you know, that, that would be a good breakthrough, right? How about a, right. How about a text message? How about that? Let's start. Yeah, yeah. Get it started. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you can go tell my whole life story to all my friends from high school, hoping that they'll contact me. Like, no, bro, please. Yeah, well, some people just don't really want to grow up. Exactly. And I don't have time for it. Yeah. <laughs> I love that attitude. <laughs> I don't have time for it. 
<laughs> if you had too many of those people, Nancy, you wouldn't have enough clients. I mean, <laughs> right yes, there. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> well, but there, there really is a lot of estrangement going on between adult children and their older parents. It's an interesting, I think mm. it's, it's a phenomena that probably didn't exist anywhere. The mm -hmm. percentage that it does now, you know, and um, I just, it's interesting. I, th I find it really interesting, but yeah, there's a lot of 30 and 40 year olds that are just saying, I'm done. I'm, I'm out of here. You I'm know? done. It's not worth yeah, it. I'm done. I'm done. I know, but I have the parents like, so mm. I don't have, I don't have the you clients. I have the really sad 60, 70 and 80 year old clients wondering that, what's going on and why yeah, and, and they're so what did they do wrong? yeah mm -hmm. exactly exactly and yeah it's sad it's strange when it's sad even when it's justified there's still yeah. it's an incompletion i call them incompletions and incompletions regardless of why they happen they weigh on you they they mm -hmm. they, they weigh on you and um I don't like incompletions at all. Like if I, yeah. e even as simple as an assignment, I have to do it right away. Like mm -hmm. even if I have three weeks to do it, I'm done the next day because mm -hmm. I can't stand it weighs on me. And I, I don't like that feeling. So um, I like to have though. people, sorry. Oh, go, ahead. go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I say that, you know, there are people that used to be on my couch Mm -hmm. And now I've moved them to my front porch mm -hmm. and they're no longer welcome on my couch, but I feel better with them on my front porch than totally out of my life. So that if I bump into them or something happens, I don't feel like I can reach out. So I, I move them off my couch and onto the front porch and mm -hmm. they can stay there. You made a very interesting observation though, that there's a relatively recent phenomenon in which uh, there there is a lot more estrangement between uh, adult children and parents, and I, my my first initial reaction was to think back to well you know in past times what would have happened is because everything happened within the family unit and the family unit unit didn't break up a whole lot I mean the whole idea of of you know children moving to different areas of the country or around the world was a relatively unknown phenomenon mm -hmm. it, it happened occasionally mm -hmm. but it was not very common now it's quite common so i suspect what happened during those times was well it was just putting up with it and yep. you know, the estrangement was probably there you know and and that's where a lot of uh, issues came up within families they, you know, they would constantly bubble to the surface because they were there but because you couldn't do anything about it well you just put up with it Right. But now we don't have to put up with it anymore. So it, it raises a few questions in my mind. One of which is, since you're dealing primarily with the parents, the ones who all of a sudden find they can't really right. make the connections anymore. Now, the, because they're the older ones, they've been around longer, so to speak. They have more experience, so to speak. Um, I'm wondering how many of them are, because of that experience, willing to look inside rather than trying to look outside for the solution? Because mm. I'm, all these solutions are, are inside solutions. Yeah. But the question becomes, how willing is a person to go inside? And I'm wondering, do, do the advanced years actually help people want to look inside? Well, I can only speak for the couple that I have. I have three clients in my history who, who are estranged from their adult. And they're very sad. Mm. And they really want to make amends. Because honestly, worse than losing the kids is losing the grandkids. Mm -hmm. So, and I can tell you, I have four grandchildren and that would just totally destroy me. So mm -hmm. I get it. I totally get it. Um, a lot of the things that have happened, happened with the kids as they were growing up. And so it's, it's sometimes it's less about what's happening in the moment than how controlling these parents may have been. And the kids are just like, they don't want it. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I have to tell you that um, way before I was a boundary coach, my son, who's now 42, when he was in his early 30s, way before boundary work, said to me, I know you've lived a big life and you have a lot of great ideas and a lot of opinions. And I know where to go if I want it. But if I don't ask for your opinion, I don't want it. Mm. And I, I was, you know, my mother and father who were 30 years older than me 
were still giving me their opinion. And here I was being told by my son that I couldn't give him my opinion. And that was like a, wow. I mean, I took it. I heard him. He wasn't kidding. And so I do wonder sometimes if people are not getting the messages because they were brought up to believe that mm. as a parent, their opinion they're entitled to their opinion and they're entitled to share their opinion. And the reality is that the kids from today that are in their thirties and forties, they don't feel that way. Mm -mm. They don't, they don't feel that way. And so I learned my lesson. You know, I tell my friends that I can have blood going dripping down my throat from biting my tongue, but that I won't give my opinion unless I know it's going to be received or that I say, you know, are you willing to hear what I think? But generally, mm -hmm. I just let them. It's their journey. If they fall, they fall. And if they don't, they don't. It's their journey. You got to let everyone have their own journey. But but in order to come to that conclusion, you had to go inside. And you have to say, okay, am I willing to accept responsibility for, my, for what my role is here? And, yeah. and am I willing to accept that role? Am I willing to thrive in that role? Yeah. Or am I going to fight it? What's it going to be? Yeah, it's really sad because I think that when the kids have made the decision, and I mean, I was very involved in one of those relationships, and um, I kept trying to get the parents to not become estranged from their son. And eventually, that son was pushing them and pushing them and pushing them till I finally said, I get it. I get it. You know, mm -hmm. he like, he was like this, like it really was more that he was, he was trying to become estranged and he kept trying and trying and trying to make them, you know, like in the King and I, like how low can you go? <laughs> that kind of a thing. And I finally just, I said, I get it, you know, do what you need to do. I get it. Even though I was like trying so hard to save that relationship. Yeah. I mean, ultimately it, the only people who can save a relationship are the people in the relationship and they both have to want to save it. Otherwise yeah. it's not going to be saved. They both have to do, they both have to be willing to do the work and they both need to step off the soapbox of being right. Mm. Yeah, that's not easy to do, is it? <laughs> that's a hard you know, thing. Yeah. But it's really, it comes down to, do you want to be happy or do you want to be right? Or mm -hmm. even like with your dad and I don't know, anything that's going on but the day will come where you won't have an opportunity anymore to make peace and so you have to really make peace with the fact that you won't be making peace and know that that's okay and then that's a decision you made and that's where you are um i'm just glad I, that that i i haven't had to deal with that and you know god willing i never i never get it from mm -hmm. my end of things so and I think about it. I'm careful. Mm -hmm. I really am mm -hmm. careful. You have to be careful. I think another piece of the puzzle from my perspective is no matter what relationship I'm talking about, I'm going to go you know, with, with my own relationships and, and the ones, there are some that I have pushed away and there are others that I have retained because I wanted to retain them. And for the ones that I pushed away, well, first of all, are there any of them that I would want under certain circumstances to pull back? I, I think that's part of, of, mm -hmm. of what growth is all about is reevaluating mm -hmm. at times, right. you know, it, it, do, do, do the arrangements right now suit me or do they not suit me? And, and very often they continue to suit me just the way they are. Mm -hmm. Very often I'm very, very happy with the way they are. Um, but every once in a while, you know, life, life brings stuff to us, right? We experience things come to us out of the blue. Some things we don't like come up, come to us out of the blue. And there are always opportunities for us to decide, okay, how am I going to respond in this situation? And if those situations involve somebody who I had previous experience with, previous relationship with, and I push them away, I get one more opportunity to decide, okay, do I want to keep it that way? Mm -hmm. How do I feel about it? And, and the reason I, I'm saying all this is as, as my life has gone on, what I've come to realize is it doesn't necessarily mean that I'm going to want to change the way those relationships are. In most cases, I want to keep them, you know, whatever the distance is or whatever the closeness is, I want to keep them that way. But it's more about what am I willing to do within myself to feel good about myself with my relationships? Mm -hmm. Because I can actually tie myself down to a point where 
I'm not growing anywhere with any of the relationships. I've been there. I've done that. And that's not a happy place to be. It's a very <laughs> unhappy place to be. But I've also found on the flip side that when I approach a, you know, any of my existing relationships with a different way of thinking about the relationship, different way of thinking about what I want, different way of thinking about who the other person is, um, just changing perspective, I guess, is what I'm talking about. And, mm -hmm. and, and uh, any healthy growing person, their, their perspective is going to change anyway over time. That's certainly been true for me. So once again, it's, a, it's an opportunity with my new perspective. How do I feel about this person? How do I feel about my relationship with this person? And sometimes, not very often, but sometimes I find, you know, I want to make a little shift here, see what happens. Mm -hmm. And recognize that the shift has to be made within me. That, that to me is the biggest part of it. I, I can't change the other person. I can't make the other person behave the way I want them to behave. I can't make them the kind of person that I want them to be. So I've left that behind, which I think is probably one of the most important things for anyone to do who's tied to that other reference thing that you were talking about before. Okay. But by the same token, I also can grow myself. I can find ways to appreciate things I didn't appreciate before. Mm -hmm. I can find ways to appreciate things I didn't like so much before. And in the process, how I can feel about a relationship might change. So th the work is actually me going inside and saying, how do I feel now compared to where I felt, say, you know, five years ago or two years ago or three mm -hmm. seconds ago with this relationship that uh, I may have kept at arm's length. And those are the situations in which I find myself saying every once in a while, you know what? I want to change this one because I, I can see that relationship differently now. I can see that person differently now. So I'm willing to at least you know, just reach out a little bit, see what happens. And if I, I don't like what yeah. happened, I can, I can just leave it where it is. Right. I also think you have to, you're not the only one changing. Yeah, so exactly. the reality is, is that you and this other person may have both evolved. And so what you still have is the, you know, the, the, the love that you once had for that person. Mm -hmm. And you may both have evolved to different people now. And so if you get back together you still have that old love, yet you're both evolved people. So you don't really know. I, I, I find it hard to believe that one of you has grown and the other one is stuck in the past. It's everybody evolves. Hopefully everybody gets, does more inner work as they go. I don't know about your father, Alex, but I'm just saying, <laughs> I'm just, <laughs> I'm just saying that, um, you know, and I mean, because I'm a coach and I'm in this work, you know, my parents both passed in the last two years, but before they died, I was forever like trying to get my mom to see things differently and to understand mm. that you can't always give your opinion or you don't have to say what's on your, you know, you don't, you don't have to always say everything that's on your mind. And, mm -hmm. you know, I worked with her um, to try to get her to evolve because she grew up with one set of beliefs and I'm like, mom, though, that, that doesn't really work today. You know, you really have to be more open-minded and not, you don't have the right to always give your opinion. You know, I mean, those kinds of things. So it's an interesting journey. Or you do have the right to give the opinion. You just don't have the right to assume that the other person is going to want to receive it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Your opinion is not always welcome. Yeah. 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 It's a, that, that can be a hard one for some people. I know not so much with this, but um, where my mom was concerned, my mom passed in uh, July 2019. Um, toward the end of her life, I was I was realizing my relationship with her was good. Um, but I was realizing that there was something about my mom that I'd never quite gotten a handle on until like the last couple of years of her life. And this had a lot to do with her background, she grew up as a child of the Great Depression. She was influenced by all those events that happened. Um, and she was she grew up in a, in a very poor family, so she got really the brunt of what happened during that time mm -hmm. period. And one of the things that, that happened with her, not so much happened with her, it happened within her or didn't happen within her, perhaps is a better way of saying it, is she never really learned how to decide what she wanted in life. Mm. And in those last two years, I, it really came, became clear to me. I mean, I would ask her point blank things like, well, what do you like? You know, not what do you like to do, but just what do you like, period? And she couldn't answer the question. Yeah. And, and I had to actually come to terms with the fact that it was very likely that she was going to pass without her ever answering that question. She didn't know. It was her, 
I mean, that's the shadow work. So yeah. her, she never, her voice never mattered. Her opinions didn't matter. Mm -hmm. And now she's what, 80 or 90 years old. Right. And she, that's not going to change. She didn't actually ever ask herself, what do I want? What do I need? What would make me happy? You know, uh, well, just, she, I, I think she actually could have changed if she wanted to. I don't think she right. really wanted to, because that would mean addressing stuff like it says shadow work, addressing mm -hmm. questions within herself, within right. her own mind, her subconscious that she didn't want to address. Right. Right. So I had hey. to be OK with the, with just respecting that. OK, that's her choice. Yeah. It's her mm -hmm. journey. Yeah. And inner work is hard. You know, a lot of people don't want to do the don't want to do the work. I can't tell you how many people will say, oh, you know, so and so I gave you a number to a friend of mine. They said that they'd be interested in working with you. Never hear from them, <laughs> mm -hmm. so, you know, yeah. all the time. And it's because they think it's a good idea in theory. And right. they can see how how much the other person has gotten out of it. But really digging in and looking at your stuff is scary for a lot of people. Yeah, it is, which is mm -hmm. kind of odd, actually, because when you when you actually do that kind of work, it isn't all that bad. Yeah, it's no, a, I love it for a while. I love know. it. Um, I'm so different. I, I, I think one of the things that I thought early on, way before I even heard the term shadow work, I had some idea mm -hmm. what it was. I, you know, I would refer to it as like therapy. But early on, my impression was, oh, my God, you're going to go through massive pain and it never ends. Right. What, yeah. No, that, yeah. that well, was one of the impressions I had. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. And of course, it's not true at all, but boy, does it seem true. Yeah. Well, it's also not true with life coaching because it's action oriented. So you're always, you're not only uncovering things, but you're taking small ch action steps to change. Mm -hmm. So there is change. You're not like week after week after week sitting on the couch, you know, going over your childhood and all your wounds and bleeding all over the couch. Right. You know? Yeah, that, that, that definitely sounds worse. That, that sounds yeah. miserable, actually. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Ours are little pinpricks. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the other odd thing because when you actually start delving into what is the the what are the early influences that have troubled me and carried on for a period of time, when you finally identify them, God, it, it, it's it's a matter of seconds to work through them. It, it when when you when you confront them really head on, mm -hmm. it doesn't take long at all. I, I would have thought it would have taken weeks, months, and no, oh, it's actually pretty darn quick. <laughs> so what we're afraid of is actually just purely in our mind of being afraid of it. Well, what's in our subconscious that's ruling our operating system that we're not aware of, when you actually bring it to the light into your conscious mind, it's from your childhood. And so mm -hmm. it made sense and kept you safe as a child. Mm -hmm. But as an adult, you actually can see, wow, oh, my God, I can so see how that how that developed and how it helped me. But I can also see how it's been costing me. Mm -hmm. And so once you give it light, it's not so hard. It's still like, you know, it's onions. You got to peel away. It can come back <laughs> again and again and again. But the reality is you can see it from your adult conscious mind and recognize that it no longer supports you. Mm. You know, mm -hmm. you are worthy. You are safe alone. Your voice matters. You're not broken. You are lovable. All these shadow beliefs of I'm not good enough. My voice doesn't matter. I have to be perfect to be loved. I have to control everything to be safe. Um, I'll never be chosen. I'm not good with money. Spiritual people don't care about money. These are all examples of belief that we get from our childhood that I no longer support our adult self. Mm -hmm. and, and there's an interesting side point that which you kind of alluded to for a moment there, which is that very often these sore points, the, these often traumatic points from childhood become the basis for tremendous stuff that comes later on. Like they, they become like the, 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 the springboard, let's call it. You know, you have this really bad traumatic event happens, but it becomes a springboard to having marvelous stuff coming out of it. And then you look back and you say, wow, that actually served a purpose. I sure didn't feel like it at the time. At the time, sure. You know, mm -hmm. sure. but later on, I could see, whoa, that actually, that actually helped me. Who would have thought? Yeah. But that's the thing about tr drama and trauma is that you grow from it. You know, what is, what's the thing about 
no pain, no gain kind of thing. You know, mm-hmm. I never wanted to be divorced and I was broken hearted, but the woman I am today would not have been that woman. I would mm-hmm. still be other referenced. I'd still be living under his shadow. And, you know, I mean, I have a story. We were separated for maybe six or eight months and I was living in New Jersey and he was in Manhattan and I went and did a century bike ride. We were both big bikers and we got to this place in this, the New York city, like hundred mile ride where you couldn't, they had a gate up because of traffic. So if you got there before a certain time, you couldn't go yet. And all of a sudden I look over to the person who pulled up next to me on the bike and it was him. Oh my. (laughs) I I look over, I say, hi, you know, and the the gates go up and I don't see him again until the last mile, which was like the Triborough Bridge. So it was the only hill on the whole thing. And I saw him in front of me and I thought, I've stayed behind in my whole marriage, you know, I'm taking this ride. And (laughs) I passed him and I get on the ferry. We're both on the ferry. And he literally said to me, you're such a brat. I can't believe you had to pass me. (laughs) (laughs) And I looked at him. I said, I have stayed. I have stayed behind you for 26 years. You've already left. So I decided to just do my own ride. And he looked at me and he said, you know, like, good one. Like, he caught it. He got oh, it. Oh, good. Yeah, he got it. Yeah. That's great. But it was like, I'm thinking, what do I have to lose? I can finally win a race, you know, and own it. I don't have to make excuses for why I won. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. Hey, well, that that's a nice uh, that's a nice addendum to the story yeah. then. I forgot that about that story. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's pretty funny. Well, well, the fact that you forgot it, that's actually, I think, fairly common. We we tend to dismiss the good stuff that happens. Yeah. Yeah. That was a good, that was good, actually. Mm -hmm. They're important to to celebrate Mm -hmm. those things. Yeah. Now, I have a question. What is shadow work? So shadow work, it's a Jungian term, and it's really for those beliefs from our childhood Mm -hmm. that are formed to keep us safe. Something happens, there's an emotional event. And we make, we give it a meaning because we're not emotionally mature enough to understand it. We all do it. No matter if you have a great childhood or you've had Mm -hmm. trauma in your childhood, we all have shadow beliefs. So an example from my own life was that I was five years old and I was playing with a lighter and I put my whole party dress up and flames and, you know, I was burned from from my my. neck down. Oh, wow. And I wasn't, they were all first and second degree burns. So even though I was in the hospital for a week, I don't have burns on my body. Mm -hmm. I never, I didn't get in trouble because my parents were just so happy I was alive. And, Mm -hmm. and so I didn't really give it a lot of meaning until Mm -hmm. fast forward another 45 years, I was in a car accident. Again, I almost died, but I didn't. And I wasn't really badly hurt, but I had PTSD and I was Mm -hmm. working with a shadow coach at the time. Mm -hmm. So she said, there's something going on here. One of your subpersonalities has like something that's triggered from this accident. And she took me into a meditative state and she asked me to look like, wait until one of my subpersonalities showed up. And all of a sudden I saw myself at five years old in my little party dress. I felt like I was in an exorcism and I was oh like, Oh my God, like, It's me at five years old. And she said, what does she want you to know? So I closed my eyes and I waited and I said, she wants me to know I'm not safe alone. Now think about Mm. it. That makes perfect sense. I put myself on fire. I wasn't safe alone. Yeah. So that was my shadow belief. And it Mm -hmm. came with me my whole life. I was a serial relationship person. Mm. I always was in a relationship. I always had a ton of friends. So it kept me safe until it didn't, until I was divorced and could have enjoyed my life and could have recognized the gifts I had and where I was in my life and all of those things. But instead, I kept thinking, I have to fix this picture. I'm not safe, you know, without even knowing I wasn't safe alone, I didn't feel safe alone. Like, how could I be happy without a partner? Until I uncovered it. And the moment I uncovered it, not only was my PTSD from the accident gone, but so was my neediness of having to be married, to be in relationship. 
So what was, what was that like to have that breakthrough? What did that feel like? Yeah. Well, those breakthroughs are amazing because, and you know, I, I have a lot of shadow beliefs. We all do, but that mm -hmm. one, because I was already thinking about becoming a coach, I could already say in my head, Oh my God, she must think like she hit the jackpot with that one. Like, <laughs> <laughs> that was so yeah. big. Like when I uncover, when my clients uncover these big aha moments, I'm like, I'm as surprised as they are. I'm like, wow, that was so cool. So mm -hmm. yeah, it was big. It was definitely a big one, but we have, we all have them mm -hmm. and they're all interesting and they also try to keep us safe. And then the other part of the shadow work is what's called underlying commitments. And that's the strategy. It's the promise we make to ourselves also in our subconscious to keep the belief alive. So my underlying commitment was to never be alone, to be the best girlfriend, to make myself digestible to everybody else so that I would always, they would always want me. That was my underlying commitment. Mm. Really good. Yeah. So something else you made reference to before, I want to bring it into the conversation. You talked about the victim story, which we've talked about mm. here in the past, but I'm curious to know what your take is on that victim story, because we certainly have lots of them. Yeah, you know, everything that happens to us, we think it happens to us instead of for us. Mm. And we see ourselves as the victim in our story. And the sad part about being the victim in your story is that it's very disempowering and you're stuck in it. If you're the victim, there's no way to really climb out of it instead of seeing that you're actually the co-creator and that even if it's just from your shadow beliefs that attracted the situation and people into your life, that sometimes that's all that is yours is your belief that you came into the relationship or that you attracted that person into your life. That could be all the co-creation is, but it's still a co-creation. And once you can recognize that you're not the victim, but you're part of what happened, then you can, you can move into acceptance and surrender and acceptance and surrender is just saying, all right, I get it. But I didn't want to be divorced. It wasn't my idea, but this is where I am. And so now where am I going with this? You know, mm -hmm. what am I going to do? You know, maybe I didn't want to lose my job or I, you know, I'm 45 years old and I really wanted to have children and I never did, but like, this is, my reality. This is where I am. What can I do now? And you can't do anything as long as you remain the victim in the story. One of the key components, of course, of victimhood is a sense of powerlessness. And I'm, I'm sure we can talk about that. But there's also another thing that comes up. I imagine you have run into it um, in people that you have worked with as clients or people you've just known, which is that sometimes victims find that their victimhood is a form of power. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We ain't ready for that conversation though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's true. And, and mm -hmm. it keeps you, you don't, if you're the victim in your story, you don't have to look at your own crap. Mm -hmm. You don't have to take, you don't have to, if your belief is that, you know, I'll never be chosen then you don't even have to look at why you're not being chosen. You have that belief and that's enough and you're the victim, you'll never be chosen. Instead of, you know, I say I want this, but what I'm experiencing is this. I say I want to be in a relationship, but what I'm experiencing is seeing what's wrong with every guy I date, you know, and leaving them before they can leave me. I say I want to lose 50 pounds, but what I'm experiencing, and then you can say, you know, my whole family's fat and I was brought up on this and we believe this and love and comfort and food and it's all entwined. Or you can say, you know, so that's your belief. That's your victimhood. Instead of saying, I really want to lose 50 pounds, but what I'm experiencing is having cookies every night or... Mm -hmm binging, watching TV and being on autopilot and not recognizing what I'm eating. So victimhood allows you to not take control 
and make the changes that you need to make. As long as you're the mm -hmm. victim, then you're helpless and hopeless for change. Well, I think there's also another component too, which is that now this is not true for all people who experience victimhood. This is true for a small subset, mm -hmm. but there is a small subset of people who are in that victimhood status who really treat it as a status and who use it manipulatively. They, they, mm -hmm. they'll, they'll use it to yeah. guilt other people. You know, yeah. you, you have made me a victim and therefore you owe me in some way. Yes. Oh, for sure. It's the, it's a very low level of you, you owe me, or you did this, so you owe me, or I've had this happen, so I deserve this. Mm -hmm. It's a low level of, of intelligence, of, of emotional intelligence, really, of thinking that, that way. But I, I listen, I know people who are drama queens, and mm. they define themselves by yeah. their drama. Like when yeah. I work with them, they actually have the belief that without the drama, they would be boring. Sure. I was just going to say that. Yep. It's crazy because mm -hmm. really what happens as an adult is that everyone's sick of your drama. Mm -hmm. We're not buying into it. We're not interested in it, but you haven't learned that. And you're still buying, you're still shoveling it out. Well, and it's not terribly surprising in one sense because we live in a society that's based on drama. Yeah. So mm -hmm. their society keeps mirroring to them. Well, everybody else is getting by with drama. Look at all the, the gains other people make with their drama. Why should I let go of mine? Mm -hmm. yeah. The same person actually told somebody, you just have to guilt them into it. Guilt works every time. <laughs> wow. <laughs> They're actually that open about it. That's pretty We out here. <laughs> yeah. Unbelievable, right? Yeah. Unbelievable. I know. Well, I mean, I've, I've seen it uh, in people in law of attraction circles. Mm -hmm. yeah. it, it, it is one of the hardest challenges to face up to, facing up to the idea that I am responsible for what I attract into my own life. Mm -hmm. right. and, and there are some people who just refuse to do that under certain circumstances. They say, yes, it's always true, except for this one area. Yeah. How can and it that, be? Yeah. 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 And, and, that, and that area is, it's always something that is very dark. It's very, you know, certainly represents some kind of situation that nobody would ever say they mm -hmm. favor, you know, like, you know, uh, a parent uh, losing their child or, uh, you know, uh, somebody mm -hmm. being attacked by somebody yeah. else or, you know, that, yeah. it, it, something like that. And, and, and so in those circumstances, they're going to say, well, yeah, it doesn't really apply there because I mean, that, I, that, that's just an innocent person being, uh, you know, affected in, mm -hmm. in some adverse way. We can't, well, I, we certainly wouldn't blame them. They always bring blame into it. Right. right. Not, not, yeah. Blame was never actually part of it in the first place, but right. they bring the blame into it. it. It's a really big challenge for a lot of people. Yeah. Uh, not a lot, but a significant number. I don't want to say a lot. It makes it sound like a large chunk of the population, but there is a significant piece of the population. It's a big challenge for them, especially when they encounter these ideas. How am I going to get around that? And they basically say, I'm not going to. I'm not going to get around that. That's that's just it's there. It's a part of life. And, you know, I it, it, it the law of attraction doesn't apply there. Mm -hmm. the risk <laughs> so interesting yeah it's resistance it is it's huge resistance yeah and it's the biggest challenge of all trying to face up to that stuff because mm -hmm. i think all of us want to all of us want to have that abundant life even those of us who don't know anything about loa we all want to have that abundant life yeah most uh of us maybe don't even think that it's possible but even among those of us who do think it's possible we struggle we struggle a lot and the hardest lesson of all is recognizing that we have to go inside to make the whole thing shift. Yeah. And that every choice matters Yeah, and that you're 100% responsible for all of your choices. Yeah. And that's really hard. People don't want to have to, I, I have clients like I, to me, because I know that I'm capable of following through the thought that every choice matters and I'm responsible that's a gift for me because then I know, okay, great. If it's just me, then I can handle it. Mm -hmm. Other people are like, oh, no, I don't want that. You know, they want to blame other people. They don't want to be responsible. Yeah. So like when really bad things happen, it is hard to figure out like, well, what's the gift here and what's the lesson? And I get that. And I, I you know, I don't ever want to have to get into a conversation with a parent whose child died in a horrible yeah. way. You know I mean? 
you, you got, there are some things that let's just leave that off the table. But I've had clients that like ha have been in a relationship, one in particular with a sociopath and I mm. dated a sociopath too. They're, they're very addicting because mm. number one, they're like chameleons. They, they sell themselves to be everything that you need. Right. And then they make, it's like an addiction because the love and the makeup sex is so high. And then the fighting is, so it becomes this roller coaster addiction and it's very hard to get over them. And it's very hard to also, then it becomes very hard to see how you could have anything to do with it because that mm. person is such a sociopath. But what I tell those clients is, you know, they were married 35 years and the first person they dated was the sociopath. And I was married mm. 26 years, same sort of thing. And I say, you were such an innocent. You were like candy in his hand. But I can tell you that you'll never fall for another sociopath. So that was your co-creation. You mm. were an innocent. You didn't, you were, you believed everything that he sold you. And it's easy to do, but that will, you will never fall for that again. And what a so, great perspective. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. that's how you can sort of see how your co-creation could be that simple. It's just your beliefs that you brought in that attracted that man, you were so broken in that moment and such an innocent in that moment that he was like, he swept right in. But the lesson that you got out of it, that, that you took away from it was, I will never fall for that again because now I'll I know never... what to look for. Exactly. Right. Exactly. That's huge. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And that was the only way I could get her out of the victim mode. It That, mm -hmm. that actually took weeks and weeks and weeks. I mean, usually that's quicker but with a sociopath it is really it really is hard because they're so evil and twisted and good at what they do mm. that it is hard to see how you had anything to do with it because you came into that relationship so open hearted and they were so evil that it's hard to take responsibility but once she saw that she was able to then start working on change mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's amazing how it, it takes one insight. Yeah. Just one different way, one new perspective, one new way of thinking about something to just shift the whole conversation around. It's it's her aha moment. Like, okay, yeah. I get it. Yeah. I see it. And now I can make a change from here. And that gives everybody hope. Mm -hmm. No matter what their situation is. Right. Because all you got to do is find that one aha moment. Mm -hmm. which is exactly. really what the shadow work is all about. It's finding the aha moment. So, and there's so many of them. I mean, you know, we all have them for so many. I was just having a conversation with, it was funny because I was walking up the mountain with a friend of mine who's always on a diet and her daughter who is a little heavy right now. And I was saying how like I grew up with the shadow belief that love and life means always struggling with weight. Hmm. Because I had a mother who was always on a diet. And when uh, I brought that up, the two of them like looked at each other and the girl nah. said, tell me about it, you know? <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm like, yeah, well, you definitely got some shadow work going on there, girlfriend. I can tell you right away because it's mm -hmm. true. We all have them. It's funny how this stuff pops up. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. one thing that is happening is that it's popping up more often. I mean, we talked earlier about how... Um, because people are able to move not just away from home, but far away from home. There's a there's sort of a diaspora that goes on now uh, among the population as children become uh, adult children. Because of that, I think we're starting to see a lot of stuff looked at that wasn't being looked at before. Maybe, but it's like, you know, my parents, I, I said this earlier, they both died in the last two years. And my sisters and I were, they could not have had better daughters taking care of them mm -hmm. to the day they died and they were amazing parents and we were amazing children in their death and mm -hmm. i feel sad that that there are a lot of good parents out there that are losing that because they were good parents but their children are it's much easier today to just write them off and not really put together how much they really had 
did do for you in your life. And I'm not, I, I, I don't mean it as like, I didn't feel obligated to do it. I want, it was a heart. We all wanted to be there and do that for our parents. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I see some of my clients who are in their eighties and they're going to die alone. And I find that so sad. I really do. So I don't want to get on that subject again, but I do think that kids today are, it's easier for them to walk away than it, it than my generation. Like yeah, our, sure. genera our generation versus <laughs> your generation, I'm assuming, mm -hmm. right? And, yeah. and so I'm, and it's not a blame thing. I'm just saying that you're right. Um, the kids move out, they're gone. And especially if you didn't have a good relationship, you know, but I'm uh, the two out of the three that I know of, they did have a good relationship, but maybe they were controlling, maybe they were opinionated, um, but they certainly weren't abusive and they certainly mm -hmm. tried to be good parents. I know that because I, you know, I know that, but it happen it can happen anyway. And then mm -hmm. there you are. Very interesting perspective. It's one of the things that I love about doing this show. I, I encounter all kinds of fascinating perspectives and you presented one more really, really good one. So mm -hmm. thank you for that. Before we part company for the day though, you can't just go away. You have to actually okay. share some information about how do we find out about your book and how do we find out about you and how if somebody wants to work with you, how do they reach out to you? So okay. who is in on all that stuff? Okay. Yeah. So um, it's going to be in your show notes, right? I think I sent yeah. you my media kit. Okay, so you've got all this stuff, but- so my book is Bigger, Better, Braver, Conquer Your Fears, Embrace Your Courage, and Transform Your Life. You can buy it on Amazon. It's a, it's a soft cover, you know, paperback. It's also the Audible, which is me. It was a bigger, better, braver moment for me to do my own Audible. And um, if you want to have a free call to see if coaching with me works for you, that's also um, will be on your, in your notes. But that's a link on my website. So my book is on my website, all of my different certifications, the free discovery call, um, a free chapter to my book. All of that is on my website. And that's nancypicardlifecoach.com. And I have a new course that's on this company called Gen Connect You. It's called Career Strategies for Achieving Your Greatest Potential. And you have the, a code that's BBB success for 20% off that course. I'll make and sure that's that we sort that of like the bigger, better, braver, you know, for the working, it's really for a working woman, actually. Um, how to set healthy boundaries, how to move beyond your shadows and all that good stuff. So basically it's all on my website. Okay. So we'll link everybody to the website and we'll, we'll include the uh, code so they can mm -hmm. get 20% the off. Great. So fabulous stuff so thank you very much thank you this has been yeah. fun yeah we, we 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 explored topics in a different way i like that whenever we do that mm -hmm. it's it fun way yeah yeah well it's fun yeah. and it, it's also educational in the sense that i i really do believe i've said this many times that the best thing we can do is, is get as many different perspectives as we can possibly get mm -hmm. yeah but the more perspectives yeah. we get the more we grow the more we improve the better our lives get mm -hmm. and the more we have to appreciate yeah yeah. I just like the, the organic, like I, I've been doing so many podcasts and I meet such cool people, like very mm. like-minded people. And it's really, really interesting. And I love yeah. it. So um, thank you for that. Oh, we're, we're very glad to have had you. And, and Alex, I'm so glad that you're continuing to heal and, and get better. Stay on that path. All right. Yeah. Promise me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, did I, t I told you the tube is out, right? You did. Yes. That's yeah. fabulous. Congratulations. Uh, as of Tuesday, I am free. Ah, that is so important. So good. All right. Well, we're going to trust that you're going to stay on that path because we love you. Yes. Yes. Right. Stay so, healthy. Thank you, thank thank you guys you. very much. Thank you uh, to our podcast listeners everywhere. And we will see you all next time here on LOA Today. Goodbye. Everybody. Great. Bye. <laughs>